Hey everyone, this is David Bennett. So I'm going to review a program called Decode Chess. Website is decodechess.com. And I thought it was really interesting when I came across it. I thought, okay, well, notor chess computers, you know, chess programs are notorious for not providing expl you know, explanations for the moves. They just give you these moves, but they don't tell you why. So it's kind of this divide that we have between humans and machines. And uh, so, well, then, you know, on the other hand, people are saying that we're becoming cyborgs. There's an essay actually called Gary Kasparov is a cyborg. Because Kasparov and Anand from India, who was some world champions who, who were at the forefront of using computers in order to improve their chess. So they were able to sort of meld themselves with the computers. But what about for regular players, for club players? You know, you play at a club or maybe you play in tournaments or you're just trying to get better at chess. You're serious about the game, but you want to, you know, use this as a supplement. Maybe you get coaching. I think that's good if you you know, can study on your own, you get coaching, get some qualitative analysis. But the question is, to what extent can computers, you know, using these so-called chess engines really help us? So when I came across this decode chess, I thought, this is interesting. This seems like something new um, because it provides actual verbal analysis. In other words, the computer is explaining its moves to you. Why is it doing what it's doing as opposed to just some string of moves? So let's jump into it. What I did is I took a game that I played in, um, it was a couple years ago in December of 2016. And uh, this was in the Eastern Open. So I did a positional queen sacrifice. Now, in other words, um, you know, I gave up my queen for long-term gains. Now, this is something that computers often struggle at to understand the nuances, the abstractions, right, or something like that, as opposed to I sacrifice my queen for immediate gain. Computers thrive in those types of things, like I give up my queen and I get a checkmate in 10 moves, or I, you know, get some immediate payoff. But if you don't get immediate payoff, that's where it's really complex. So I thought, okay, let's challenge this thing. And let's see uh, how it explains Stockfish's moves. By the way, Stockfish is an open source um, computer engine, you know, chess engine, if you haven't heard of it already. And um, so you can download it for free online or use it on leechess.org, which I often do to analyze my games or the Grandmaster games. So let's jump into it. Um, now, this was the game, starting with E4. And by the way, I'll just show you the website. This is what the website looks like. So it says Chess Analysis with Explainable AI. Um, it's the product of Chess Stories. And it talks about how it you know, explains the moves of stockfish in rich, intuitive language. Um, and it, it looks like it's meant for aspiring players uh, in the ELO ranges of, of up to 2,000. So up to approximately expert level. So pretty strong players. So it's, it's not saying it's, it's for masters. It's saying that it's for players that want to move up to the expert and master level. So that, I'll keep that in mind as I'm, as I'm evaluating it. Okay, so let's look at this game. After E4 d5 we have scandinavian defense and by the way I, as i'm doing this i'm going to sort of tell you how i like to you know how i as a human would analyze the games and i like to get you know if you ever watch any of my videos i like to get really deep into the analysis so i'll, I'll try to i'll try to spare you that a little bit but i'm going to do it as sort of a comparison so it's like okay here's how the human thinks about it and here's what the computer thinks about it so uh, and what, how it works is you have to click on the move that you want, from what I understand, and then you press decode. So after the Scandinavian defense with d5, e takes d5. Now I just said, okay, let's decode the opening. So I press, after knight f6, I hit decode. And I think it says it takes about 90 seconds. It takes like a little over a minute uh, for each position, depending on the complexity of the position. So after knight f6, here we go. This is what it looks like explaining the best line uh let me just make sure yeah i think that should that should work here you can hopefully you can see the entire screen let me let's get a quick glance at it uh yeah it looks like you could see some of it okay so you might, i may have to explain a little bit on the right side of the screen but basically what what you see is it gives you a summary of what's going on it it explains the threats that are you know pertinent threats in the position which i think is one of its strengths although you might say hey well any you know, any chess engine could make arrows that point to threats. But it is nice to at least have, you know, have it specified and have it explained. So if we click on, of course, knight takes d5 is what Blacks has in, Black has in mind. And it says, you know, things that reasons for it. And it gives a, a slew of reasons. Um, and it says it undermines white good moves, such as d4, bishop b5, because it allows playing knight e4 prevents okay so it, it gets really in, into the weeds in terms of the reasons for um you know knight takes d5 as a threat 
So why white might, white might want to worry about that? So, uh, okay, so it's a lot more than just an arrow. That might help you there. Now, um, I think that it's, it's a lot. There's a lot at once. Uh, some prioritization, I think, could be good there. But, hey, it's, it's nice to have it. And then it tells you good moves. So here's, in other words, okay, when you normally look at it, like on stock, just regular these in Stockfish, it'll give you preferred lines of the computer, or sort of branches of the tree in a calculation tree. So it thinks that D4 is the best move. And this should be five check is the second best move, et cetera. So it's kind of nice to have that organized, have that clearly explained because I know that the, you know, Stockfish or other, you know, Komodo, other chess engines could be a little bit daunting for some people. So it's nice to see that, um, you know, D4, and then it gives you a sample line. Okay. So there's that. And then it has plans. So just moves. Well, it would be nice to see some more, you know, verbal analysis. But, you know, we get that after knight f3. White well, can respond to, for example, knight takes d5. So now we got knight f3. Can respond to knight takes d5 with, now it gives a line. Well, okay, it's, again, I mean, what I mean is that it doesn't have that rich kind of um, explanation of a plan, because it, it says plans. It's more like, here's a line. At least you get a sample line. So, okay, here's what it thinks, you know, here's what the computer thinks you should do in this position. So it's saying that white should now here, for example, I would I would say as a human, white takes the stake in the center. White claims the center. Uh, that's important. Central control is a very important strategic concept. I would like to see some, you know, something on that uh, th that the computer can give in language. After bishop f5, okay, say we're activating. Why are we doing that? I want to see a reason for that. Well, we're activating the bishop, um, perhaps getting it outside the pawn before we close the pawn chain, so we can activate before e6. Although we might play g6 in a lot of these lines. We might be on Keto the bishop this way too. Can I sh show that? Yeah. We might want to come this way. Um, now we can't really make arrows with it, but um, okay. Now bishop comes to d3. Why does bishop come to d3? Why are you trading? Well, white has more. So then you want to get, I don't know, that's getting really deep into it. But a lot of times if you have more space, you're trying to attack, you don't necessarily want to trade. So why here? Why do you, computer, why are you telling me to play bishop d3? That would be nice to know. Um, queen takes d3, c5. Why do we play c5? Well, I, I would assume it's because we want to strike back against the center. That's important. I need to know that. A club player, see, this is the kind of thing where, you know, a club player looks at that line and they say, like, a, maybe a 1200, 1300, like an intermediate level player, and they say, yeah, why c5? We need that explanation, the positional idea. I think that's probably my biggest critique that you'll see um, throughout this, based on based on my um, what I've seen so far of this program. Of the analysis from this game so okay so white fights back in the center and then it says well it gives a bad move um, and then it says after this you cannot so it, it, that's interesting it's actually providing an example of how black can go wrong which is better than just sometimes than just showing let me just show you the computer like moves from both sides it's saying hey here's if your opponent makes a mistake well Queen takes because, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, we, that's a little obvious. Um, by the way, I should say we should take it with a grain of salt because this is the opening, and we shouldn't rely on computers for the opening anyway. We should, you know, read opening books or watch, you know, grandmasters, watch how they play the game. That's probably far more productive. Um, but I'm, I was just curious as a sort of point of reference, you know, because I didn't even do this initially. I, was, I wanted to look at the meat of the game and the middle game, the strategy, the tactics. But I was thinking, okay, let's just look at this and see how it compares. And be, now you get sort of an overview of everything. So we have functionality. It says the black knight of f6, the white knight of g1. So it, it breaks down the functionality of every single piece, every single pertinent piece, I guess, in this in this position. Um, and so it says the black knight of f6. Um, well, the white pawn at d5 is threatened by the black knight, of course, and we can capture the pawn. Okay, what are we saying about the knight way back here on g1? It says White can play knight f3. And by the way, I was playing with some, I was playing with the black pieces here, which is why I have it um, flipped around. Because um, sometimes it's just it just automatically puts the white pieces. So I flipped it to look at it from my perspective. So at least showing you my game, I can explain to you again better what I was thinking. Um, okay, so basically functionality explains the pieces and what they can do. That's something. There's something to that. I mean, it might be self-explanatory, but you might also miss something. So it could be useful. Concepts. I like that. So concepts, white can play d4, that's important. Okay, does it give an explanation for that? Yeah, white can play d4, but why? Okay, well, you you know, it could be, I think it wouldn't be so hard for the for them to program this to say, 
Well, you, you play d4 because you control the center and you unleash that bishop on, uh, on c1. Unleash the bishop, control the center. Easy enough. But that's important. You know, that's important. Um, oops. Did I just get rid of that pawn somehow? <laughs> um, okay. So, and then that, yeah, that, was the, that was the last analysis of the different, um, you know, the different tabs. So we have summary, threats, good moves, plans, functionality, and concepts. Okay, so now let's, let's look at this as the game evolves a bit. And, and again, you have the arrows. So it, it shows the knight coming out and it shows, well, this, this pawn is obviously under threat. So it makes it red. And it shows that white might want to play knight f3, which is generally a good move in response to knight f6 in the Scandinavian. So it's sort of, I'm offering a, a gambit pawn, sort of. I'm allowing the white to play pawn c4 and guard it, but that's not really recommended uh, to try to hold on to the pawn because black will then be the one who really gets the initiative, putting pressure on the opponent. Now, again, that might have, that may have, you know, it would have been useful to see that as well. So again, th this is early, you know, it's early in this program from what I can see. I think it was, you know, I think it was launched recently. So those are areas where it can improve. And again, we can't really hope for, the, for it to tell us too much at the beginning of the game. We want to rely on an engine for the middle game, maybe the end game too. They should be very precise in the end game when there are only a few pieces left. They have very concrete variations. Okay, so I take the pawn back. And, okay, so you can see the next one, knight b6 is the next move I requested analysis for, to decode, in other words. d4, taking the center. g6, I'm preparing the fianchetto for the bishop to come out and attack the center and castle, the castle my king, to get it safe. Now, he does g3, which is kind of interesting. I've never seen this before. I guess you can call it a positional approach, which is what, which, you know, makes this game even more interesting to analyze, I think. Because he's not going for a quick, you know, push for c4 or something to attack my knight and get more central play. He's just playing really patiently with g3 and bishop g2. And this was the last round game, too, of the Eastern Open. So it was an important game. I might expect a little more, you know, sharper play, but this was interesting. I don't mind it, of course. It doesn't put pressure on me immediately. So I bring my bishop to g7, putting pressure on the central pawn. And now if white does play c4, which I don't know if it gets into, but if they do play c4, it would actually lessen white's, you know, weaken white's grip on d4, since you lose the ability to play c3. I think it does get into the strength of, this, of c3 as a possibility. Um, so bishop, I'll get to the analysis of the next one in a couple, a few moves down. So bishop g2, okay, we both castle our kings, and I bring my knight out. This is all logical. I, I did think a bit on this. I thought, okay, do I want to play for the c5 break, similar to what it recommended in that other line? Or do I want the more direct knight in front, and maybe even get the e5 Maybe even, you know, get this break in right here. So this, uh, so knight c6, I, you see this a lot. Um, it's the most direct. I mean, look, we have a bishop aiming on this. Queen is looking through the knight once it moves. So we bring another piece out to hit that d4 pawn and just to make our opponent uncomfortable. So we do that, knight c6, um, h3. Seems a bit quiet. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, well, he didn't want uh, bishop g4. Now, it would be interesting. Okay, you know what I'm going what I'm gonna to do? I'm going to actually decode that while we're looking at the others, and I'll come back to it. I'm just curious as to well, let's actually um, no, we'd have to we'd have to decode knight c6 to see if it even mentions h3. But let's look at it after h3, and let's just decode that to see. Uh, oops, I'm already 20%. Okay, I'll have to be quick. And we'll plug an instant at the wall. So after h3, um, yeah, let's see what it thinks. But we'll go back to this. So knight c6, uh, and then knight after h3, I go knight b6. So now I thought this was kind of like the first moment in the game where I would want to come up with a plan, where both sides sort of, you know, have to figure out what's going on here, what's the plan, how are we going to resolve any tensions in the center, and so forth. So we're really getting into the middle game now. After knight b6, now it says summary. The position is about equal. Uh, let's see, how do we make that bigger? I think if we click on this, click on summary, and does it, no, it's kind of a small window down there, um, but it says the position is about equal, but white should beware of black playing knight takes d4. So that is the threat, right? Explaining the best line. Now it mentions c3. Okay, it does give c3, but again, I would want to see 
you know, why is C3 a good move? Okay, it doesn't lose the pawn, but it doesn't, I don't even know if it says that, maybe under threats. But it's important to also note that C3 reinforces white's center. So that's the positional idea. The sort of longer term idea is to hold strong center. The immediate, I, the immediate idea is I don't want to lose the pawn. Um, but what is the explanation for that? Is anything given? Not really. Oh, okay, it is. I'm sorry. C3 is beneficial. Okay, I take it back. So we have C3 is beneficial because it supports the pawn at D4. I want to try and I thought there was a way I can make this bigger. Um, the knight B6. I'm trying to. Yeah, hopefully that's showing up. Okay, it is. But you can see it's beneficial because it supports the pawn at D4. That's all it's saying. Well, that's the reason. Okay. That's good. Now, oh, now if we press plus, we can expand it. And then it gives you actually some lines, such as, well, we know that just an obvious line, but we know that if the knight takes, we lose our knight because it's now supported. I mean, that might be helpful for a beginner, you know, that especially players who, you know, lose just based on getting a, you know, just hanging a piece or something, or maybe it's a two move combination or something where they lose a knight or lose a pawn. That could be really useful. So, um, Okay. Yeah, there's some explanation there. So we're, but I, I think it's its strength is really in the threat analysis. So we see what the threat is. We see how to stop the threat. That's important. And it does, and it's, and it's, it is useful to have a little bit of language that comes along with that, as opposed to again, as opposed to just an arrow. Um, now, if we click on threats, we can see that there's a lot of pressure on. E and d4. Not only that, it's interesting. It even mentions that bishop e6 is not really a threat, but it's something that would benefit black, you know, just getting an active bishop out or hitting him with e5 first and just cracking the center open. Now, the, let's see what it says. And interesting, it even says threat status before playing c3, after playing c3. So before the threat is dealt with and after the threat is dealt with. Okay, I like that. Um, now, yeah, earlier it was it was making this part bigger. I'm not sure why it's not, you know, it's sort of prioritizing this this part here. I would really like to see it coming here to show me the bottom of the page. I'm trying to scroll down. Maybe if I had it open, I'm using a Chrome browser. Maybe if I had it open uh, on the app, it might be better. But yeah, that should be easier there. Maybe a little bug there to see, to scroll down. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm scrolling down on the page and it's not, it's not doing it. Hmm, only on this side, but I'll click over here. Okay, so maybe some interface user issue there. Um, oh wait, can I just minimize this? That might do it. If I click on this, there we go. Okay, that's it. So then we can uh, just focus on this part of the board. So it, it says knight takes d4 and bishop takes, okay, obviously knight takes is preferable. So if it says minus 0.81, it means that it's, Essentially, they call this sent upon. So it would be almost one pawn up for black in terms of its evaluation. Now, if it doesn't say it's minus one, that means it, that it means it thinks that white has a little something in return for the pawn because you are winning a pawn. But that point one nine is basically what it thinks from its initial analysis. White is getting in return in compensation for the pawn. Now, if you take with the bishop, it thinks that you only get even though you get the pawn again, you only get minus point two six. That way. Well, getting rid of that bishop would really behoove white there. Okay, good moves. So it's saying that a good move for white is a4. This is immediate again, this is immediately after knight b6. So it thinks that white's best move is a4 in descending order. See, I like that. That's that's nice, especially because you get that user friendliness when you're when you're looking at. Um, let's say I click on. Uh, okay, I was on here on the streamer page on Lee Chess, but if we go to Tools Analysis Board then so like let's say we have any position after uh e4 d5 let's say we get this now you get okay it's actually only giving us one line it's giving us its preferred line i think there's a way also to have it give us in descending order but it's just it, it's a little less user friendly that way so so the way it prioritizes that is nice okay so we have descending order so a4 and then it gives c3 which is a reasonable move that's interesting. So it actually thinks that the best move is not to stop black from taking d4. Ah, it's maybe because the awkwardness created after this pawn would be pushing down to a5. 
that's interesting. Chasing away the night. Well, let's let, let's look at it. So I'm curious as to why you say a4 is the best move for white. So 0.2, meaning plus 0.2, like as if it's one fifth of a pawn in value. Now remember, that's not always material. That may be Stockfish may be having some more abstract reasons for the evaluation, which is what I really want to see explained. And that's the hard part. See, are, are, does this do humans understand what they, they programmed? Um, you know, they programmed this this machine, this this um, you know open source software to come up with the best moves. But are we able then to, yeah, in other words, decode it to to reverse that and say, okay, well, here's the reason why it came up with this move in this circumstance. I guess it have to it would have to break down the algorithm or something. But but how do you take that? How do you really codify that or or, or decode, you know, in but in language in in English or ideally in other languages too? That would be cool to see if it gets popular. Um, I guess you know it started in English, but I don't know if it's already available. But if you can make it in languages worldwide, that would be great. Um, so let's see after a4 for instance now if we take with the bishop now i'm wondering why i take with the knight well can we play can we play knight takes let's see does it even let us fiddle with it yeah we can good because that's one of the actually one of the benefits of working with an engine is that you can try things out so you don't take it as gospel you know you should question everything so if it gives you something you say well what if i take with the knight and then it should give you analysis to that and one of my critiques is that maybe like i just kind of pre-packaging the entire you know, thing for you. It's comprehensive, that's great, but it might disincentivize analysis, engagement with the engine a little bit. Now, when I do knight takes d4, I'm actually not even seeing an engine like, you know, doing that live analysis. So I don't know, maybe there's a way to do it, but I'm, I'm not, based on what's available to me here, it's not showing me that. It's just showing, so I did the move, but where, you know, where is the, yeah, there's nothing there. So that might be um, a little thing that could be improved. Either it's there uh, and I don't know it, or it can be provided to me so I can use it as stock, you know, as I would engage with Stockfish regularly on leadchess.org, for instance, if I wanted to. So after it's recommending A4 bishop takes. Now that was the move that said, well, it wasn't that good for black. Why are we taking that? Well, after we're giving up that bishop. Now, again, there's another perfect strategic concept. You're giving up the bishop pair. Not only that, so, okay, these are approximately equal, right? And not in a bishop. Some people say a bishop is slightly more valuable at the beginning of the game because you might have the, the bishop pair if you can possess the bishop pair, things like that. And they're just, and, and they are, you know, they're swifter than knights, although each one only covers one color square, either dark squares or light squares, which is why um, the bishop pair is so nice because they can work together. Now, after bishop takes d4, uh, we're giving that up, and not only that, but we're giving black an un or sorry, we're giving white an uncontested dark squared bishop, which can then infiltrate our king side. So after this position, see, we've given that up for, for good. Now, okay, maybe that's why it recommends taking the queen to try and get those queens off the board, so you don't have to worry about some checkmating attack with the bishop infiltrating. Um, but again, I mean, yeah, we've got a pawn, but it's clear that white has significant compensation for that pawn in the form of the bishop pair mostly. Now, okay, this is this is concrete though because we're getting hit with a uh, with the pawn. So we okay, we come in, we attack b2, put some pressure there, and then the pawn just keeps running. That's interesting because it's undermining b7. See, I'm telling you how I think about it. This is how I approach it. Now, if you can get a human to tell the machine to do those things, I think that would be the next step, you know, to to think about those things. I'm a6 is played because it undermines the pawn, b pawn's protection of c6. It sort of does that a little bit, in, in not not in sidelines though. But maybe there should even be an option where you know you decode it, but you might say, hey, I'm not only interested in more in, in a particular move in the game, but I'm interested in this side in this one move in the sideline. I want to know why was a6 played. That's my question for you right now. Well, I guess if you really wanted to, maybe, oh, wait, can I decode this position? I'm sorry. Yeah. We, okay. I'm still getting the hang of it. We can. So I just pressed decode for the position at hand, I think. And there we go. Decoding basic. Okay. Never mind. That's good. I'm glad we have that. So let's see. I'm, I'm curious as to what it gives for A6. Does it tell us that, you know, the reason for it? So I guess we can really dig in there and do that. That, that is useful. Um, okay, we'll come back to that. Okay, now h3 is done. So let's come back to h3. Um, when h3 was played, um, 
No, it's still in progress. Okay, it'll be green when it's done. Okay, so we're on knife u6. And that's, yeah, some interesting lines there. After knife u6, we'll get rid of, again, we have to, it looks like we have to click on this thing. Um, I did a lot of decodes, as you can see, because I wanted to break it down and get snapshots of, you know, at various places in the game. So after this, get rid of that. Okay, so we're on a4. Let's just look at the rest of that line. And after knight c4, a6, rook b8, a takes b7. Well, we can see it's already weakening the control of this c6 knight, but the bishop takes back. Now the bishop takes on c6, undermining the knight's protection of, of d4. But again, that, that, that could all be explained. And again, it looks like we can click on it, but it would be nice if the text just kind of popped it, popped in there. But I guess that would take even more time decoding. Uh, okay, so then we have to get rid of the queens, trade them off, and then we take back the bishop, and then a seven's hanging now that they took this c6 knight, which was guarding a seven. That's pretty direct. See, the more abstract idea was the fact of giving up the bishop pair and the benefits for white. The more concrete idea is you undermine c6. When you take c6, you undermine the queen and you undermine a7, which the rook then takes. So now what are we at? Four or five pawns against five pawns. Um, and again, that's why it says at the end of the line that white is barely better. Well, we get to take that pawn. Uh, they could take c7. Well, you're hitting the, um, the, the, the rook. So the rook has to move. And now they're looking at c7 and e7. So they get a pawn back. Okay, the knight comes in here, a little trick, unleashing the knight. Um, sorry, unleashing the, the rook when the knight moves to hit the rook. So we can take on b1, a little bit of a trick. So after takes, but again, there may be a positional idea behind that. Why is that happening? Okay, I understand you're, you're, getting, you're getting a knight for a knight out of that transaction. But I see other features. Well, the fact that the pawn moved to d3, the fact that the rook got to invade, that's, that's all relevant. Now, actually, well, part of it is, is tactical, too, in that by taking here, we are precluding the rook from taking on e7 because this would drop with check. Um, but now we get rook takes c7, and basically it's approximately equal. It gives white a slight advantage. Um, interestingly enough, the, this rook hitting the bishop makes it so that, well, we have to deal with this. And also when you move the bishop indirectly, well, now you're guarding the, the bishop on c1. And we can choose, uh, I guess you take with this one, and then you break in, and we got four against three. So maybe, well, then we can probably go like bishop here and try to take this one. But it, it looks like, you know, in some of these lines, it, it may, oh, that's kind of weird. because So when I click off it to try and get rid of the piece, like to try and, you know, click off it, it, it went to there, but I'd rather have it. Let's see, can we just go back? Okay. Yeah, sometimes that's useful, but I'm not sure if it's useful there. Um, but at least it allows you to move around the position. Um, but you don't want to, yeah, at least you just let go of the piece. Okay, plans. White has no attacks in this position. Now, again, that, that you know, we got to get beyond that. It's not about an immediate attack. Planning in chess is about, obviously, you know, it's about 10 moves ahead. It's not about moves. It's about long-term, thinking ahead. So I'd rather... Um, Look at the, well, that, that's con conceptual. That has the concepts tag. Um, so if we know the concepts, maybe we, we can then come up with a plan. So functionality, again, we get into uh, what the different pieces can do. And then we get into concepts. So the white pawn on C2 can move to C3 to support the white pawn on G4. Okay, that makes sense. White can play rookie one. Why? Well, let's see if we click on that. We might want an explanation on that. Some positional ideas there. No, we don't have an explanation. The explanation that I would give is the rook comes to e1, occupying a half open file because we have, don't have any pawns. They have one pawn for white, and black has one pawn, white has no pawns. So, um, so white gets to come here and put pressure on this pawn, as well as, um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, just getting, getting on the half open file, increasing the activity of the rook. So we'd want to get into those types of things. Um, the black knight at c6 controls the e5. Okay, that's interesting. What well, might help you to play e5? It might also make it harder for for white to play knight e5 himself as an outpost, since you could just take it. And we're putting pressure on d4, which the black knight at c6 can capture, which is the immediate threat that we got into. Now, what does it say about the, the knight controlling e5? Now, again, there's no explanation. So this, especially as we're getting a little higher, you know, as you're getting to, if you, if you say this is for, you know, under up to 2,000 ELO, 
we're talking, you know, we're talking experts. Well, if we say internet, so let's say an expert in the U.S. is 2,000, which is 1,900 maybe in fee day. But so a 2,000 fee day could be a 2,100. Let's say U.S. is a little bit inflated. So 2,100, that's, that's well into the expert range. So an expert, someone who's aspiring for expert anyway, needs to know something like that. Um, they need those explanations. Why is that important? Now, again, I mean, it's it, it's a supplement. It's not going to tell us everything, but I think it's something that could definitely definitely be done. I don't see why not. Tell me why that control of E5 matters. I get it's controlling E5, but tell me why it's pertinent to this game. That would be helpful. And why can play G4? Well, okay, let's say why you might want to play G4. Any drawbacks of potentially playing G4? Is there any language with it? Okay, well, it's more like you have... They give language and they give lines to explain the language. So I'm a, I'm asking for a lot. I want language, lines, and language explaining those lines. Um, but yeah, there's a lot here. I mean, there's a lot of it, it is comprehensive in the concepts. Now a lot of it is tactical again. It's tactical rather than positional or strategic or long term. So I would like to see a little more of that. So white uses the a8 to h1 diagonal. Um, so that would be A8 to, you said A8 to H1. Oh, from here to here, right? So, it, yeah. And just like black uses the H8 to A1 diagonal. I think it mentioned that as well. So at one, one, at one point, uh, one of the moves I saw, it mentioned that. So, and white can play A4, which was, which was one of the lines it recommended. Now, does it say why? Why would you, because I mean, a lot of players just, you know, say, why do I want to do that? I wouldn't have thought of that. Well, okay, obviously you can go and bother the knight. Um, but you're gaining space on the queen side and undermining that knight might have such and such benefits, you know, so I, again, I, I would like more detail. It's like, I would, there are a lot of lines and to supplement these, these concepts, but, but yeah, a lot of it's about just what's under threat, what guards, what, which is good to see. And especially if you're analyzing one of your own games and you're thinking, okay, what, what do I need to be looking out for? At least in terms of threat awareness, that's good. Now let's get to the more complex stuff when we get really deep into the game. So when I get to the queen sacrifice. So after he played in the game, c3, strengthening the d4 square. Bishop goes to e6. Rook goes to e1. Okay, now we have to actually think about an exchange sacrifice by giving up his rook for the bishop. Generally, a rook is five pawns or five pawns. A bishop is three pawns worth. So we have to consider that you know abstract idea of... of, of sacrificing a piece um, a rook for uh, for a piece that would um, you know maybe give white something less tangible in return so does it mention anything or oh, we didn't decode that but it would be interesting if it mentions that now after a5 so I did this now I'm trying why am I doing that it's partially it's part of my plan to gain more control of the light squares so I already have my bishop aiming here and I have my knight aiming at c4 and d5 so if I get to a4, it actually enhances my control of this diagonal. It actually reminds me of the position I literally just looked at in Silman's book, How to Reassess Your Chess. I looked at uh, a game that I haven't looked at for a while with a student. And he ends up playing a4, uh, a5 to a4 here and really enhances that diagonal. And then eventually the queen helps the bishop on the diagonal and wins the a2 pawn and so forth. Um, but it, it's really sort of a light square strategy, whereas... White has control of the dark squares. I'm sort of playing for control of those light squares in the center. And you'll see I enhance it soon. By, well, I literally occupy the light squares. And now I actually free this E pawn, which was, which was blocked. So I don't know if it would, I don't think it really gets into things like that. Things like that would be good though. Um, but I'll show you the next, the next position uh, that it analyzes is a few moves down. So we're both, we're both developing our attack. Now this E6, why did I play that? Well, I'm reinforcing my control of the center, um, and I think there was an, well, it turned out to give me something else in the future. Um, I'm also potentially, I think it was maybe a knight maneuver, e6. Also, I don't have to worry about the e7 pawn as much. Um, let's see where this goes. It may not be the best move, but it worked out. Knight a3, then I go h6. So now I'm actually thinking about going g5. So he comes in with his knight. Well, he's attacking c7. I defend it, and he goes g4, I go g5, he brings his bishop back, and I hit him with f5. So I'm playing very aggressively now. Um, now, I, I decode it in a minute on the next move here. So I'm gaining space, 
yeah, I'm weakening e6, but notice that it guards the bishop. They have this mutual relationship where the pawn guards the bishop. The bishop guards the pawn. And after knight to d2, I hit him with f4. And there we go. So we have the, the orange, um, the highlighted, underlined bishop h2. Now here I was thinking, okay, does the computer tell me the, the main thing about this that's going on? What is the human thinking right now? When, you, when that bishop goes to h2, what's the first thing you're thinking as a human about that bishop? Well, the bishop, for now anyway, is, it's, it's basically buried. It's trapped. So I was very curious. Does the computer say anything about it? Well, it says black has a small advantage, minus 0.41, which would be almost the equivalent of being up like half a pawn. And should be aware of white playing not e4. Okay, we have to watch out. That looks pretty annoying, not e4. Uh, and it gives, again, it gives those you know highlights where the sort of tension points are. There's some pressure on d4. There's some pressure between the bishops. This well, this pawn is highlighted, it's strong. It can maybe ram forward or at least just be there. This pawn protects this pawn, protects this pawn. We have a pawn chain, and it smothers that bishop until he's able to play king, you know, king moves, and the bishop goes back, and then the pawn's gonna have to move here. So it's going to take, it's a cumbersome process. So at least I've shut him out of the game for now. I've gained a lot of space on the king side. So suddenly the evaluation you know, shifts to black. So we understand that. And if you put that in Stockfish, it'll show you that black is now slightly better. Um, well, it might want to mention that e6 could be a potential liability. It's again, the rook is hitting it. I think we're okay because we'll get e5 in. It does explain that. But again, why? Why does that matter? It should, it should say because it would, it would remove the weakness, put pressure on the center a little bit more. Um, and liquidate white center, in fact, so it would do a lot of things. Um, so let's see. It says rook e8 is good, so it likes my move. It actually, well, it's saying in this in this position, it thinks this is the best line. So it's not based on what I did, but we, based on what it thinks I should do, um, which is what happened, but rook e8. And then it thinks that white should take, and it gives this entire, um, oh, here we are, after bishop h2, and it thinks that white should go ahead and take on d5. I'm going to plug it in now. Uh, I think there might be a little bit of an issue though. Let's see, because I think it's the wrong, I may have to adjust the camera for a second into the other port. But after queen takes, rook c1, knight c4. Okay. So this is the best line that it gives. and. Um, Oh, it actually explains too. Along the way, it does give some explanations as to why it thinks a particular move like knight takes e4 is good. And again, it's it's mostly dealing with threats. Um, okay, I think I think what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to come back in a minute, so we'll have like a part two, and then we're going to look at that queen sacrifice to get a little deeper, and I'll give some conclusions on uh, you know what I think are the pros and cons and going forward. So I'll be right back with that.